All right. So today I have a doctor and a nutritionist, and I have a bunch of questions for them. I got Nutrition by Victoria, and I got Peter Rogers, MD. Uh, you've you've seen both of them on my channel over the last year, and I reached out and said, "Can I ask you two uh, questions?" And let's see if this turns into a heated debate or if everybody agrees on everything. So welcome to the channel. Thank you. Thanks. Do you guys want to run down like some of your education or do you just want to get started? Whatever you want. Mm -hmm. All right. I guess let's let's just give a little background. So Nutrition by Victoria, you were on here first. So what is a little bit of your background? All right. I have a bachelor's of science in biology and I have a master's of science in human nutrition. And I've been working as a nutritionist for the last decade. Um based on just like doing my own thing, my own research, my own like experiments on my body, testing different diets. I guess I'd say I've actually been doing it for more like 15 years. I'm um, just trying to figure out what works, what doesn't. So. Perfect. And Peter Rogers, MD, what is a little bit of your background? Yeah. So my background was, you know, when I was in college, I was a wrestler. I went to Stanford. I was student athlete of the year over there. My coaches were world and Olympic champion Schultz brothers. So I was very used to a very intense level of academics and uh, education. My mid thirties, though, I got fat. I got up to about 220 pounds, real fat for me. And I couldn't lose the weight. My parents were sick. My mom had uh, cancer. My father had coronary artery disease. And at that time I was very much locked into the conventional mindset of medicine. You just go to the specialists and see what they can do to help you. And it wasn't until I sort of realized conventional medicine had nothing to offer to me and very little to offer to my parents that I started to read extensively on this nutrition and diet stuff. And I'm like, wow, holy crap, this is where all the good information is, epidemiology, nutrition, and toxicology. And none of that stuff is taught to in the medical school world. Yeah. Like, this is where it's at. And, you know, there's no money in it, but this is what really helps people. This is what saves people. So I, I continue to do it as a hobby because it's a good thing. Perfect. And I guess we should get started with the first question. Um, I, I guess we'll just go ladies first. So is eating below baseline the only way to lose weight? Now, when you say baseline, you're referring to what? Like basal metabolic rate. Uh, you know, if, if somebody were to calculate your basal metabolic rate, is it good to eat like the standard 500 calories below that? Yeah, no. Um, there's several, actually, Neil Barnard talks a lot about this in his books and how eating below baseline, you're going to trigger metabolic um, ad adaptive changes that will convince your body to become a fat storer. So you under eat, you're telling your body to store fat, um, basically, is what it comes down to. Now, um, at what level, how much do you need to eat to avoid? convincing your body to store fat, um, that's going to, you know, be variable among everyone, depending on what their current metabolic rate is, what your previous diet looks like, um, and what your current diet looks like. So for instance, I know a lot of us are in the high carb, low fat community, you know, that's what we're promoting on our channels. It's how we personally eat. Um, but even within that realm, um, I, I, identify a lot of people as like yo-yo dieters because they'll under eat on a high carb, low fat diet. And then they'll, you know, come back and say, Oh, I gained 10 pounds. I gained 20 pounds or whatever. And it's because they are eating too low to maintain their weight loss. So they need to, um, they come back and they have a rebound basically it's standard, you know, yo-yo diet cycle. Um, and that, you know, is going to, <laughs> <laughs> uh, unfortunately be the case for most people like the yo-yo dieting until they kind of eat themselves out of that. And there's a lot of, um, hormonal things that are at play that allow us to achieve like our metabolic set point based on eating as much as we want, eating enough carbohydrate calories. And a lot of that comes down to leptin. So, uh, I could get more into it, but I'm going to give it over to Dr. Rogers. Now. All right. Yeah, okay, well, a couple things. The lower the percentage of calories from fat, the skinnier the population is. You know, you look at those Asians, you know, the Chinese or something, watch a Bruce Lee movie. A billion out of a billion are skinny, except for Bolo, he's taking steroids. You know, it makes people skinny. Uh, white rice got 1% of calories from fat. Look at Papua New Guinea. They used to eat 93% of their calories from sweet potatoes. That also has 1% of calories from fat. 
They're all skinny, pretty muscular, pretty healthy. Um, also, regular potatoes got 1% of calories from fat. Tends to make people skinny. So if you want to be skinny, eat the, eat those low percent of calories from fat. Uh, let's see what else. I got my notes on another computer. That's why I got to look up a little bit. Oh, here. Okay. Um, the other thing you watch out for is there's lots of estrogenics in personal care products, laundry. I don't use laundry detergent, uh, laundry softeners, none of that stuff. Because I think your skin is primarily fat. And in fat, like dissolves like in chemistry, meaning that estrogen is a, is a fat. So it dissolves, transdermally is absorbed into your body. So my advice is go minimum on all these personal care products. I just put my my laundry in, in hot water. Okay, that's just one example. Filter your water. Have at least a carbon filter for your um, your tap water. For example, uh, there's tons of estrogenics in your tap water, and they don't remove a municipal water filtration typically. It's easy to remove with a carbon filter. So all these, like a woman takes birth control pill, a thionyl ester diol, EE2, and you drink it, you know, when you drink the water. So to minimize your intake of estrogens, you want to avoid things in that way. In addition, eat adequate dietary fiber. Adequate dietary fiber causes your gut to, you know, have the so-called good gut bacteria. I think all the stuff about gut bacteria is totally exaggerated. There's really two types. There's good and there's bad. And when I say good, it's the fiber-eating bacteria. So if you eat the fiber, if you eat a lot of fiber, you get the good bacteria, and they help you to excrete estrogen from your body. Estrogen is a fat storage hormone. That's why you want to reduce it in your body. You just want to have normal levels. Okay. So my point is when you have a deficiency of dietary fiber because you eat a lot of meat and processed food, you get a different type of gut bacteria, the ones I'll call the bad bacteria. They have more glucuronidase enzyme, which unconjugates the estrogen in your gut. Normally, your liver excretes estrogen. It conjugates it with glucuronic acid, goes into your bile, goes into your intestine, you defecate it out of your body. But when you have the bad gut bacteria with more glucuronidase enzyme, they unconjugate it, separating the, separating the estrogen from the glucuronic acid. It's reabsorbed in your body. Estrogen levels go up. And I can tell you, I've seen a lot of women who tell me every woman in their family had to get a hysterectomy before she's 35 from fibroids. And I'm like, it's because you all do the same thing. You're all meat eaters. You all are drinking tap water. Um, so they're low in dietary fiber. They're high in meat. They got the bad gut bacteria. And so they, they crank up their estrogen levels in their body. Estrogen cause, stimulates proliferation of uterine cells. Uh, so it increases the risk of fibroid tumors, benign tumors of the uterus. It also increases the risk of breast cancer. But when you get those hysterectomies at a young age, before age 35, the woman's much more likely to become prematurely hypertensive, have coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, and dementia. So it actually makes them stupid. Um, there's a few other things. So estrogen, yeah, it's a big thing. It's fat storage hormone. There's a guy by the name of Chris Knob. He's an ophthalmologist. He's a pretty smart guy. You know, he's everybody's got a bias. He he works, you know, with the Western Price Association, who tries to tell everybody to eat grass-fed meat and all that. But he still has some good things to say. He tracked the epidemiology all over the world, and he saw the best correlation with obesity and diabetes was the omega-6 cooking oils. Hmm. And I think it's real important. Don't eat any oil, not one drop. And that includes no olive oil. It's all BS. All that stuff about olive oil being good is all bogus. They'll compare it to a straw man and say, oh, gee, it's better than a straw man. Isn't it good? No, it's it's bad. Um, and this guy, Yamashima, a Japanese guy, showed all kinds of problems with omega-6 cooking oils. They're, they're already rancid just from the processing. And then once you get them in your body, they further undergo lipid peroxidation. And they become toxic in a lot of ways, including they're damaging the pancreatic beta cells. I think that's why the incidence of diabetes is so high in people from India. You see all these Indian people, they're skinny, you know, and they tell you that they're a vegetarian. And so I used to think all these Indian guys I know are healthy. You know, I know a lot of Indian guys, all right? But then I found out tons of them got diabetes and coronary artery disease. And I think it's because they're getting like a type one, or you can call it type 1.5 diabetes secondarily from all the fried food, from the lipid peroxidation. And so Yamashima, that Japanese neuroscientist, he said also they'll cause lipid peroxidation damage through hydroxynonanol, a toxic aldehyde, in their um, uh, hypothalamus, the arcuate nucleus hunger center, and that that's also making it more difficult for them to regulate their appetite. And that implies that a person who ate this junk food diet for a prolonged amount of time has damage to their hunger center in their brain, and they're gonna have a harder time regulating that the farther on they go. So you always wanna try to fix the problem, the sooner the better, because it might be more difficult to fix in the future if you don't. Um, let's see if I got any other thoughts here. Uh, so you're, you're, you're basically saying that if it's damaged, you can't eat too much. If, if your body's ability to know if it ate en enough is, is damaged, then you could eat too much. Yes, so. yes. I'm saying that as time goes by, they're unlikely to fix the problem. I can also just say from personal experience, most fat people I know are fat forever. They have to make a dramatic change, like go low fat, low sodium, vegan, 100%. And most people, it's their basic nature to be half-ass. I think, you know, if we look at human, our physiology matches a herbivore for our dietary taste and all that and health. It also matches the way the human brain works. Like a herd animal with a big pack, 
they sit in the middle of the pack. The safe place to be for a herd animal is in the middle of the pack. So the average person, they almost never do anything sort of out of the ordinary. And so what they all say is, well, I'm cutting down, I'm cutting down on meat, and I'm cutting down on oil, and they're all fat and sick. They don't ever get better. Um, the, the person who gets better is the person who says dramatically, okay, I made a mistake. I don't eat meat anymore. I don't eat oil anymore. You know, they, they, they make a dramatic change. That works. It's like an alcoholic. You don't tell alcoholics you can get drunk on the weekends. You tell them no more alcohol. Same thing with cigarettes. You don't quit except for the weekends. You quit. Um, then your body has a chance to catch up and heal. The other thing is I think a lot of people are stressed out. Mm. They're stressed out, so they're working long hours. When they work long hours, sleep deprivation is, is felt by the body the same as chronic psychological stress. You get increased cortisol, which kind of makes you fat, and um, you tend to crave junk food. Um, so and people drink a lot of caffeine, which is kind of goes hand in hand with sleep deprivation, and I think that contributes to sort of a chronic high stress, chronically... Uh, inflamed person who becomes fat. It just, uh, it's a bad way to go. You want to be, you know, kind of well rested and calm. So anyways, I think that, I think that's it. Let's see if I got anything else interesting. Yeah. I was just reading today that you can get type two diabetes from elevated cortisol without even just because it's going to cause your blood sugar to be excessively elevated all the time without mm -hmm. even like making any changes to your diet. Wow. That's interesting. They just found that out. Well, I would say too, you know, there's a lot of BS going around on the internet. Let me give you a typical explanation. I'm not going to say their names, but I'll see these so-called experts saying, oh, sleep is very important, but it's fine to have three cups of coffee a day up until three o'clock in the afternoon. You know, BS. You shouldn't drink any coffee at all. None, zero. It, it, it raises your blood lipids. It raises your blood pressure. Uh, it, it, it's, it's actually causes basal constriction to your frontal lobes. And it, um, it's, it's, it's an excitotoxin on your brain while simultaneously decreasing brain blood flow. Okay. And the older you get, the more fragile you are. So you want to stop with that. It's a bad habit, but it's, you know, it's a billion dollar food. So it gets all this publicity. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's everywhere. All right. Let's move on to the next question. It, which is, is eating strictly whole food plant-based the only way to lose weight or can you have refined food within that. Okay. Am I first? Yeah. Let, let's just go in the same okay. order. Um, yeah. So I, well, I personally eat a mixed diet. So I, most of my diets, whole food plant-based. And then I also have, uh, I call it sugar supplements. So some refined sugar actually as a supplement to my diet. Um, I found that by me personally, when I eat whole food plant-based, I can't consume enough calories to meet my workload. So I have a very high workload. I'm a, an athlete, a breastfeeding mother, a mother of three. I'm productive with a business. Um, so personally, I either end up eating a lot of dates if I'm not adding refined yeah. sugar or I add some refined sugar. And I found it has improved my gut functioning, my overall energy levels. Um, I've found nothing but benefit from it. But the the kicker here is that I keep my dietary fat extremely low. I eat no overt fats, no oils, no nuts, no seeds, um, no animal products, not, none of that stuff. And it allows me to stay very insulin sensitive so that I don't have any negative uh, health effects from this. The other thing that I found um, is I was more prone to iron deficiency anemia when I was eating whole food plant-based. Um, I don't want to say it was from the diet because I just, in general, that's just my genetic predisposition is towards that. I was like that as a younger um, adult, um, as well as a teenager when I was playing sports. Um, and the only diet that I've ever consumed that has allowed me to not have an issue with iron deficiency anemia is combining a high carb, low fat, whole food, plant-based diet with the addition of refined sugar. And the um, reason why the sugar works so well in terms of like helping with iron deficiency anemia, for instance, is because it enhances iron uptake or iron absorption. Uh, along with vitamin C. So by, you know, not eating the foods that interfere with iron absorption, I've been able to uh, maximize my iron absorption in my own body by including the refined sugars. But like I said, you have to be very diligent about not consuming overt fats. And a lot of people, they can't be that strict. So um, I would say if you can be strict, you know, add the refined sugars uh, because it does in um, Percival Hemsworth's, um, 
research i'm gonna try to screen share but i know the baby's crying too so i apologize uh but i just want to show here there's kempner's work here we go so this is um i believe yeah it's from the nih and, and this is from the 1934 is when this was received Okay, here it says it is now established that the sugar tolerance is impaired by starvation or the taking of diets with a high content of fat, whilst it is improved by taking diets containing excess of carbohydrate. Um, so by eating sufficient carbohydrate, you're allowing your body to be more carbohydrate tolerant, insulin sensitive, decreasing insulin resistance. And then here is um, this is from McDougall's website. Uh, and he used a high carbohydrate diet, the rice, fruit, and sugar diet, which is predominantly what I eat and I recommend to my clients as well. Uh, but I recommend using sugar to taste. Um, so not, you know, eating like a specific amount of sugar every day, like learning your body and feeling, you know, when you need to add sugar, if you need to add it to your diet to make something taste better, to improve energy levels, et cetera. Uh, and then I always recommend you know, having enough fiber in your diet too, so that you have a nicely regulated blood sugar response. Um, okay, let's see here. But I think that's all I wanted to say about it. I actually think that people can have better results in terms of weight loss if they include refined sugar because it prevents you from eating the fat. So sugar increases satiety, whether it's coming from the whole food carbohydrates or it's coming from the addition of refined sugar. I know Neil Barnard and McDougall, they recommend using sugar to taste in both of their protocols. Um, so I think there can be benefit from it if it definitely helps somebody to keep the fat out of their diet. Perfect. And now to Peter Rogers. Yeah, I've heard Dr. McDougall say, ah, you got to let people put a little bit of sugar and salt on their, their plant food or they won't eat it, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's fine. And he's talking about sprinkling it on the outer surface of it rather than intrinsically putting a lot in while you cook it, you know, either salt or sugar. A um, couple things, too. If I was going to eat the sugar, I'd make sure it was organic because uh, the non-organic beet sugar might have all that, uh, like, Roundup glyphosate sprayed on, so I wouldn't want that. I also reviewed the dietary fats. I came to the conclusion that they're all bad. I basically agree with Nathan Pritikin um, that basically any desire to seek extra fats is always a negative thing for one's health. You get an uh, adequate amount of fats from all your plant foods. You don't need to seek them out in any particular way. As a matter of fact, I, I made a, a, a internet post about, I said the only good fat is fiber fat from dietary fiber. And of course, you know, I had previously been on the Bart K show, as you know. Yeah, yeah. Bart K is kind of <laughs> like this crazy guy. He's full of yeah. BS. He just basically insults everybody and anything. Yeah, yeah. And not, nothing useful comes out of his, his no. he never reports any useful information. But here's what I thought was funny. The, the, the Bart K followers, they all call me stupid. You're stupid, you're stupid, you're stupid. And they go, fiber, fat, are you stupid? No, there's a reason why I say that. Because the dietary fiber is converted into fat. It's converted into short chain fatty acids. Some of it is, okay? In particular, butyrate, the four carbon fatty acid that is used by the intestinal lining cells to prevent leaky gut, to make their tight junctions. So it has a protective effect on you. Plus, some of that dietary fat is made in two carbon acetate, three carbon propionate. They go through the portal vein to the liver, and the liver makes those into whatever fats it needs. So what I'm trying to say is, even when you eat a very low fat diet, and Pritikin had quoted several studies where they were eating controlled diets, less than 1% fat, and the patients did very well for prolonged amounts of time. So my conclusion from that is basically, and also if you look at the fat, where does the fish get their omega-3s? The fish get their omega-3s from eating plants, okay? We get all the omega-3s, omega-6s from plants. And by the way, we need at least 10 times more omega-6s than we need um, in our body. We got like 11 times or more omega-6s than omega-3s. It's like the foundational, that uh, linolenic acid, linoleic acid is the omega-6 in all your mitochondria, cardiolipin, inner mitochondrial membrane, your phospholipids, that's the big one, cardiolipin. So anyways, there's sort of like this public mentality of, oh, omega-6 is bad, omega-3 is good, we need more omega-3s. No, you don't. Actually, I think people are overdosing on them. They increase your risk of prostate cancer. They cause immune suppression. Uh, they increase obesity, diabetes, insulin resistance. All that stuff is bad, okay? And I stay away from nuts too. You know, they're like 70 to 90% fat, okay? And olive oil, it's bad for blood flow. It's also obesogenic, insulin 
uh, diabetogenic, you want to call it, it's bad. Uh, so I agree. I think low fat is the way to go for from everything I've seen. Excessive amounts of fats can also activate mTOR. You get down that whole uh, set of issues. Yeah. Uh, so I think those, I think low fat, what I like about the low fat um, vegan diet is the starches, they satisfy hunger real well. They're low caloric density. So when they're low caloric density, they stretch your stomach. So you get early satisfaction of hunger. As they go into your intestinal tract, it takes time for the enzymes to peel off the fiber, separate it from the polymer of uh, glucose. So you get the slow blood glucose coming up in your blood and it stays in the normal blood glucose range a prolonged amount of time. You feel pretty good, you know? And I've been eating the OMAD diet now for years and I'm real happy with it. That means one meal a day diet. I eat it when I come home, 100% plant-based, majority of the calories from starch, probably about 60%, maybe about 35% from fruits and another 5% from vegetables. I've been real happy with that. I don't get hungry and I'm, I'm perfectly fine all day, real energetic, get a lot of work done. I just had my fasting blood glucose done. It was 82 um, mm -hmm. the next day. So my total cholesterol bounces between 90 to 120. I got good energy, good, clear mental thought all day long. I do a lot of work. Um, so anyways, that's been working. So I, I guess what the question was, correct me if I'm wrong earlier, what's the best diet to maintain a normal body weight sustained? Uh, the question basically was, is eating strictly whole food plant-based the only way or should you add in, you know, refined foods? Oh, I, I think it's the best way, but you, you can titrate it a little bit in other ways. I think it's good to stick to all plant foods. I think that even though no naturally occurring population is 100% plant-based, I think it's best to be that way because most of us ate the sad diet or something similar, you know, some lousy version of the Mediterranean diet when we were younger, and we almost have to detoxify to a certain degree. So I also, it's hard for me to do something a little bit, you know what I mean? I can't yeah, just have one yeah. piece of pizza, you know, and as a young guy, I used to eat the entire pizza, extra large, and then go to sleep, you know? So I think low fat, low sodium, 100% plant-based, 100% organic, no alcohol, no sweets, no oils, no dairy. I think that's the best way to go. All right. Next question. Should people avoid fruit if looking to lose weight? I get asked this oh. all the time. <laughs> I know. I don't know why people don't like fruit. Like it's so tasty and it's nutritionally dense and it's low calorie dense. Like it's, it's like the perfect weight loss food, especially within when you're eating like fruits and starches of like uh, Dr. Rogers was just saying, you know, most people, you know, having like fruit and starch make up the majority of your diet, it's going to default to being high carb, mm -hmm. low fat. Um, I loved hearing Dr. Rogers that only vegetables only make up like 5% of your diet, because a lot of people get hung up on eating so much vegetables to yes. dilute the calorie density of their diet, but then they end up like under eating and then they go towards the fats and then it's like a yo-yo diet cycle, right? But when you put enough carbohydrates in and you keep that carbohydrate percentage of your diet very high, then it satisfies your hunger. It maintains normal leptin levels. It maintains a normal, healthy, ideal body weight percentage um, or BMI, I'm sorry, but yeah, it's... Uh, fruit is healthy. Uh, I was just watching today that uh, the I jump instead twins yes. were saying that fruit made them fat. And I'm like, what were you guys doing before? And then how, like how much fruit were you eating? I, I wonder, you know, when people say that fruit made them fat, um, I know for myself personally, when I came, first came to a high carb, low fat diet, um, I gained weight initially because I had been chronically calorie restricting. Um, I was using, you know, nicotine, caffeine, um, doing low carb, uh, lots of fasting and just lots of under eating, you know, that 500 calories a day. And I had a major rebound from that and it's all normal. Uh, there's a lot of science that explains as to why that happens. You know, you have to basically reset your body. You have to get your leptin back in normal levels so that it'll turn your hunger off and trigger satiety. Uh, you have to improve your insulin sensitivity after being in a calorie restrictive um, or starvation mode because the body defaults to ins being insulin resistant when you don't put enough fuel in. Um, so when there's that kind of weight gain on fruit, I always wonder, well, what was somebody doing prior? And then how many calories were they eating? Were they in a starvation mode where they are bringing their metabolism back up to speed? Are they improving their hormone levels? There's so many questions to be asked when somebody says 
you know, I gained all this weight on fruit um, because, you know, fruit is, is a whole plant food. It's got carbohydrates, fiber, water, nutrients, you know, it is something that naturally triggers satiety when you eat enough of it and get enough calories from it. Um, so one thing that I do want to um, talk about, and I, I think you were going to ask this question next, so maybe we won't uh, talk about this right yet, but fruit naturally contains a higher amount of fructose than it does uh, glucose. Um, and so people will say, well, I gained all this weight on fruit. So it's because of the fructose content. Um, but I, I think you were going to ask a question about that. I do later, have a right? question about, yeah, that's like okay. three, three or four questions. Okay. Well, cause I, I don't want to get too much into that if you're going to ask about it, but, um, yeah. So I think that this all comes back to like being able to regulate your metabolism and your appetite signaling. And if somebody is saying, you know, I gained all this weight on fruit, then it's likely, you know, there was some, something else going on. Um, so we have to identify what the cause was yeah. in order to determine, you know, is fruit really the problem? But what I will say for myself personally is that, um, I eat like fruit until four. So I'll snack on fruit and like some refined sugar as needed, um, throughout the day because it's nice and light. It digests so quickly. Um, it gives me energy, um, uh, without, you know, putting me into like a coma basically, which yeah. is what my starch meal does at the end of the day, uh, it shuts me down. I, and I like that it does that, but I have nice, even energy and regulated appetite and all that eating fruit throughout the day. Um, and, but I will say like, if I ate fruit at dinner time, I don't, I wouldn't feel satisfied. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I will say that if all you're eating is fruit and you're finding that you're never satisfied because all you're eating is fruit, then, you know, eat some starch too. I feel like when we allow ourselves to have all these different kinds of combinations of carbohydrates, you know, fructose, glucose, monosaccharides, polysaccharides. Uh, disaccharides, it gives our body lots of different carbohydrate, you know, molecules to work with that in turn help to satisfy us and satisfy predominantly our glucose needs for ATP production. So um, I think that variety is key amongst, you know, eating your high carb, low fat diet, and that will help to promote satiety as well. Perfect. All right. Okay. A couple of things about fruits. You know, fruits taste great, you know, nature's candy and all that, but they're more expensive than starch. Um, and in addition, they in general, they don't store as well. I mean, you could freeze some things. You could freeze like a blueberry, for example. But in general, fruits kind of spoil faster typically. Um, other things about fruits is they don't satisfy hunger the same way starches do. Like I know I can eat this giant big bowl of starches and then I'm full. That's it. I can't eat any more starch. Yeah. But after I've done that, I could eat a giant bowl of fruit afterwards. It's like, it's almost like, uh, I have to use willpower to stop eating fruits. Where starch, it just fills me up. It's biologic, metabolic. I'm I'm full, but not with not with fruits. I could keep eating unlimited amounts, pretty much. I could like for I found myself I quit eating apples years ago because I would keep eating a whole bag of ten, then I eat another five, and I'm like, why am I eating fifteen apples? I mean, it was just so easy to do. I wondered if they were spraying MSG on them or something. You know, they look all too similar. You know, when you get them in a bag at the grocery store, even these are organic apples in comparison with, I used to have apple trees in one of my old houses and we pick them, you know, they're quite variable and, you know, they're a little messy looking versus, you know, they might have worms or other things versus yeah. you get them from the place. They're all perfect. Um, in addition now, the other thing I worry about fruits now is um, I've heard they're putting that, you know, that A-P-E-E-L stuff on them. Um, yeah. That is supposedly is is becoming common on apples. I don't know for sure how much it is. I know it's common on avocados for sure. But yes. I've heard it's common yeah. on Would that apples. be on organic apples? Like organic apples? Yeah, products? yeah, because a peel is organic. So oh, they okay. they can put it on it. But there is a list of uh, most stores are not accepting it anymore. Even uh even Trader Joe's kicked it uh kicked it off. Like they they won't take it anymore. Yeah, so. natural grocers never takes it. But I would definitely ask them when you go over there because I read the chem sheets on it. It's far worse than people. People go, yeah. oh, yeah, there's trans fats in it. Oh, that's just the beginning of it. There was like three neurotoxins in there, methyl cyanide. It's, it's major toxic. Yeah, I, I did a video about it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's basically a neurotoxin. It's because they strip 
the fat with a neurotoxin and a neurotoxin stays in it and it's 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 bad news yeah. so basically we should just grow our own food yeah yeah Good. yeah jeez <laughs> oh, yeah i hate to say it but that would be a smart thing to do you know they talked about like that like during world war one victory gardens okay that would be smart that people people do that as much as they possibly could because i almost see something weird going on there's this big push to push everybody towards eating plant foods okay and but then when i notice most of the the popular internet you know nutrition uh sites they're pushing this high fat plant-based diet and it's almost to me seems like they want to get the the public the proles off of the meat but they still don't want them to be healthy they want them still to be sick so they're telling them to eat all this high fat food all of that is promoted um and it seems it seems bogus to me obviously bogus uh so i say that because i think by getting people off the plant off the meats they free up a lot of land so the people who got the money to buy all that land want that land freed yeah. up but i also think too one of the things though i don't like about getting rid of the meat is it's almost like they're wiping out another food source that would normally be available in the winter time. You know, our ancestors survived the winters by having meat, you know, dairy, cows, cattle, and, and so on. I don't eat any of that stuff, but if I was starving, I would. But I, what I'm trying to say is there's things happening in the background for reasons that are more than just money, it oh, seems yeah. to me. Yeah. And so- Oh yeah, the anti-carbohydrate, anti-sugar agenda is strong and that breaches into people think fruit makes them fat, potatoes make them fat, you know, it. pasta makes them fat, yeah. all of it. And it's just really awful to see like, and then the there's a vegan keto now, I know. you know? I it's mean, it's like basically what Goldner is. <laughs> yeah, I know. And, and people always ask me, well, is this what I should be doing? And I'm like, yeah. no. <laughs> yeah, my impression of that was like, let's say you have somebody who's got autoimmune disease. My first approach would be avoid everything that can cause leaky gut. <clears throat> There's a list of about 20 things. I would avoid all those things, try to have a healthy gut, if you will. There's a couple of toxins that also appear uh, capable of causing autoimmune disease. Things like fluoride, for example, things like glyphosate. I would avoid all those things. And once I've done that, if the autoimmune disease still was not resolved, you could potentially consider taking all those omega-3s, but I wouldn't go right to that because the omega-3s, I think they're not as bad as the rheumatology medications, these really powerful uh, autoimmune suppressants, things like methyltrexate and whatnot. That's like chemotherapy for cancer, okay? So I wouldn't jump right to that. I would, most people are probably gonna get better. I heard one time this guy, I think his name is Esser, Steve Esser or something. He's a pretty well-known nutrition guy. Um, he said in his experience, about 85% or more patients will get better when you just do some of the basic stuff, eat more fiber, avoid the common causes of leaky gut. But only in, so what I'm saying is in that context, I would eat more of those omega-3s, kind of like the Goldner thing, but I wouldn't go right to it. Um, and I would, but I would try that before methotrexate. It's sort of like my thinking out of autoimmune diseases. Well, they can also test for omega-3 levels as well to see if you're actually deficient so that it would be something that would be beneficial too. Yeah, I would be careful though, because how they define it, because yeah. you just the definition, because what you got to do is you got to make everybody think they got a deficiency, and then you can sell them your, your supplement, yeah. you know? Well, that's the fish oil thing right now. You know, they, they already convinced everybody they're deficient in omega-3, so they could sell that fish oil <laughs> junk. Yeah, which I, think I mean, they got all this problem. byproduct. They've got to sell it somehow. They've got the collagen. Absolutely. They got, yeah, and, and you know, whey protein, casein, casein protein. That was all illegal back in the day. FDA shut that down because they saw how toxic it was. And all of a sudden, you know, they're pushing it. Oh, yeah. It causes cancer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What's his name? T. T. Colin Campbell says it's the number one promoter of cancer. The other thing I think is funny, if you look at the arguments. By the way, I do think humans are creating the image of God. Okay, I don't. I think we're so different than chimps, it's not even funny, okay? Oh, yeah. Let's, yeah. Say, let's say we are a sophisticated new version of a chimp, okay? we got triple their brain size, for example, and gorillas, okay? Well, guess what? They don't eat any fish, okay? They come from a hot, a hot, a hot weather climate, okay? You don't want more omega threes in a hot climate. So what I'm trying to say, is, and then the gorilla eats 100, you know, vegan as far as I know. What I'm trying to say is the evolutionary arguments don't work, okay? So I always found that was a little bit funny. Um, yeah, yeah. But when you, yeah, when you look at it, you need some omega threes for the baby's brain development originally during the time while the mother's breastfeeding and all that. Okay. That's actually why women have bigger hips, gluteal regions, uh, upper thighs. They store it there because it's energetically efficient. But after that, you don't need it. I mean, think about it too. We can remember our childhood pretty well. Okay. Once we learned how to talk and to read everything, we're, we're articulate. What I'm trying to say is neurons don't turn over. The same neurons are there since birth. 
There is turnover in the sense of synaptogenesis. There's a little bit of neurogenesis. But what I'm trying to say is these, this idea of you need tons of omega-3s is totally exaggerated. Uh, most of the, the, you know, the C18-2 linoleic acid or C18-3 linolenic, alpha linolenic acid, it just sort of stays like that. And especially, like I said, too, the omega-6 linoleic acids, you need those all over your place in every cell, tons of them for your mitochondria. Uh, I actually think omega-3 uh, fish oil supplements inhibit your mitochondria. Um, if you read, there's, I found three papers on that subject very quickly, that the DHA substitutes in for the C18-2 linoleic acid, and it causes dysfunction of the intermitochondrial membrane because the cardiolipins, where you've got four fatty acids extended down, they're typically all four of them are the same thing, that omega-6 fat. They have a special relationship to bind to the electron transport complexes in the intermitochondrial membrane. And when you switch those off for DHA, that distorts everything. So instead of having a C18, that's a C22, 22 carbon fat with six double bonds instead of with two, and um, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't bond effectively to those protein complexes, and it's damaging the mitochondria. And you don't want that. Anything that damages your mitochondria is going to decrease your energy level. It's going to decrease your cognition. It's going to increase your risk of dementia. It's bad. So, all right, I'm going to move on. Um, I think this is probably the most popular question that I get is Seco Real. I mean, we kind of have answered this, but I wanted to ask it just because everybody's going to ask anyway, is uh, count, uh, calories in, calories out real and something we need to pay attention to. Now, I don't want to take too much time on this one. Like, let's give this a one minute like timeline, but everybody's going to ask it if I don't. Yeah, so that is a popular belief that you need to, well, let's put it in the context of weight loss, right? So yeah. you need to take in less calories and expend more calories. That's the common notion of how to lose weight right? That's the commonly accepted model. Um, I would challenge that and say that if you are, and, and I've already talked about this in this video, that if you are under eating, you're going to trigger starva starvation mode in your body, which is, which means that your body's going to, uh, lower leptin levels. It's going to increase cortisol, which is going to trigger gluconeogenesis and make our body, you know, not as efficient at use or not as efficient at creating energy because we need to now create it from protein and fat stores. Um, and all of this triggers eventually insulin resistance as well, which is going to make us more prone towards fat storage, especially when we are no longer in a calorie deficit and we are now eating sufficient calories because that's what happens inevitably. I watch it all the time and all these YouTubers yeah. uh, that end up getting a famous, you know, following, um, they all are, I, I have to restrict my calories. I have to be in a calorie deficit to lose weight. And then they end up rebounding. Um, I think what Dr. Rogers had talked about earlier when I was rambling, <laughs> rambling about starvation mode and stuff is that it's more important to keep your dietary fat restricted and eat freely of carbohydrates because then your natural hunger and satiety signaling will be intact. And that is what is going to allow someone to achieve their ideal lean body weight. Um, that's how I've done it. That's how I coach, coach my clients to do it. Anyone who's able to um, maintain their body weight, you know, long-term or lose weight and maintain it, this is how they're doing it. You can't be carbohydrate restricting. You can't be calorie restricting because every single time it's going to cause that rebound effect. Um, you also risk... Uh, by being in a calorie deficit, um, decreasing your sex hormone production, decreasing your thyroid hormone production. I can't tell you how many women I work with who are on medication for hypothyroidism because they've been calorie restricting for the majority of their lives. And it's really hard to come back from that ex level of thyroid damage. Um, most of them end up on medication for life. And then they also have trouble um, with weight gain for the rest of their lives because they've been keeping their body in a suppressed, you know, starvation mode state for decades. Um, but that's, you know, my answer. It's better to be in a fat deficit than it is to be in a calorie deficit and to eat freely of whole food carbohydrates, fruits and starches, 
and with the addition of sugar to taste as needed. All right. Yeah, I agree. I think that's the best diet, the healthiest way to go. Um, I think carbohydrates, you know, calories in, calories out. I don't, I don't think that's true. For example, in my mid thirties, I got fat. I was trying to work too much. I was trying to do two fellowships simultaneously. And so I figured no big deal. I'll just, now that once the fellowship year was over, I'll just exercise more, eat less. But I was rather shocked. I couldn't lose the weight for about three years. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to be fat forever. I'm going to become diabetic and have all these problems. And then, then I said, I got to, you know, and my, my, uh, sister-in-law was teasing me because I'm a little bit arrogant about my academics and all that stuff. And yeah. she's like, well, I thought I knew nutrition. You know, I'd been really good at biochemistry. They told you that nutrition. I didn't realize at that time, you don't really learn nutrition at all in medical school. And so she said to me, if you know so much about nutrition, Mr. Doctor, then why are you so fat? And I'm like, gosh, she's right. And all my doctor friends, they didn't really have any good advice for me. They're telling me take medication for your cholesterol and this and that. And so then I started That's reading me. nutrition literature and learning about it. And a couple of things came out of it. Uh, first of all, I do think we actually have a set point, a set point like a thermostat that sets our body of what we're going to weigh. And basically, you can't really beat that for too long, maybe for a couple of months or so, but you're not going to beat it after that. So you have to change what you eat and the thermostat resets itself. And when you eat a high fat diet, it tends to be set higher to make you fatter. Uh, when you eat the low fat plant foods, which I think we're designed to eat, you know, we got the flat teeth, we got the long intestinal tract, we uh, don't make vitamin C. Um, that seems to just make your body go well. Um, I also look at my productivity. You know, I see how strong am I when I lift weights? Um, how, how able am I to concentrate? I often have a very busy intensity. I still work as a clinical doctor and then on my days off, I often do a lot of academic work anyways. But I say to myself, can I concentrate well, you know, as long as I expect to? Because I often have to concentrate well for 12 hours in a day and I can do it just fine on this diet. And also my family noticed my mood dramatically improved. I was a little bit grouchy, they said, before I became a vegetarian. And that kind of mellowed out. You know, maybe that part of that's as you get older. Um, you know, McDougall also says the fat you eat is the fat you wear. It just tends to make you gain weight. I think there's some truth to that in the sense that when you take in a protein, it's largely for structural purposes. Uh, and it gets broken up into its individual amino acids. You take in a sugar, it's a relatively small molecule, it's already half oxidized. But whereas when you take in a fat, in order to get all that fat storage, it's absorbed en toto. So fat's really designed for storage. You know, it's a dry storage because most of it's just that hydrogens and carbons in that big fatty tail. So what I'm trying to say is you can store tons of it. Um, so I don't think, I think it's a waste of time to pay attention to trying to like count your calories or drive yourself crazy. Just eat the food you're designed to eat and it tends to just go to the right place. You know, you eat these low fat, like for example, beans. If I was trying to lose weight, I would eat lentils instead of garbanzos. Lentil, lentils are about 3% fat. Garbanzos are about 13% fat. I also think soy is bad. I think soy is totally exaggerated. I think soy is promoted as a way to sterilize chumps. There's a lot of things in the dietary supply that really are making people infertile. I think soy is a big one. I think the atrazine sprayed on the corn that's not organic is a big one. Um, I just heard about this new one. It's called Chlormiquat that's being sprayed on the non-organic oats. It's, they say it's in Quaker oats. They say it's in Cheerios cereal. Yes, um, I've heard a lot of bad things about Cheerios lately. Yeah, so you, I think you want to try to eat organic. You know, in general, starches tend to be relatively cheap. They tend to store for a long time. And you do have to be careful. There's a lot of stuff in the food supply. It's not good. And I think... It's almost if I had to say to myself, you know, the big controllers, if you will, of, of society, what do they want? And I think they want decreased numbers of, of the people in the public, if you will. And I think the way they're trying to achieve that is dramatically increase in fertility rates. And because when you look at it, it's almost everything is part of sort of being pushed towards that. And like I said, the atrazine on the corn, the, the GP, the aluminum in the tap water, the aluminum sprayed in the sky, all that stuff it's all pushing, you know, that lower sperm counts. Most of these things, it's also a metalloestrogen. Um, there's a whole bunch of little things, call them slow poisons if you want, that are converging on making people infertile and also on feminizing society as well. Oh yeah, that is happening. Yeah, the, the, other, blast. the other thing with that too is the promotion of the high fat, low carb diet. Eating enough carbohydrates, it at least for a woman, it improves our sex hormone profile. And then for a man, it, it increases testosterone levels. So if you think that carbs are bad, you're gonna naturally you know, have less fertility rates uh, amongst the population just based on that fact alone. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah. I doubled my testosterone by adding a pound a day of sugar, but my gut couldn't handle it anymore. But I, I literally have the yeah. blood test. <laughs> <laughs> my gut's like, bro. Uh, but yeah, yeah I, I mean, I've, I've had three children and I've had them all eating a high carb, low fat diet. I've had zero miscarriages. I've had no problems producing sufficient breast milk or getting pregnant. Um, in fact, I have to be careful not to get pregnant. Uh, and then that just comes down to, you know, eating the species specific diet that we're designed for. Yeah, I think there's be off the charts infertility. I, I already have some, know some people that work in that business and they are saying, you know, more and more patients going down that path. The thing is you, you, you go to infertility clinic though, and they tend to emphasize stuff you can bill for, you know, um, taking the pills and, you know, in vitro fertilization and all that, rather than this nutritional stuff. This nutritional stuff is really not known in the medical community. It, it's, it's, it's shocking how little of it is known. Um, it's actually disturbing too, because so much chronic disease could be managed just with dietary intervention versus medication. And then you'd have less patients and you'd have more time with the patients and, like working out the things that, I don't know, I could go on a rant about this. I'm sure you're aware anyways. I have a lot of doctors in my family. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. The saying goes, if you cure the patient, you lose the customer. On right. the other hand, if you match the old to the pill and you send a bill, you keep them hooked on drugs for life, make money off them every day. Eventually the drugs fail worse and worse. Then you can do surgeries on them and make more money on them. Um, and so, and, and then it's a popular thing too. Imagine you're the ruler of the country. Okay. They don't, um, they don't pay that much taxes. A lot of old people, they're retired. They're collecting a pension. They're collecting insurance money for their health care. They're sort of seen as a financial burden and expense on society. So there's not much incentive to try to keep them alive longer. Um, another thing, we briefly had talked there about hypothyroid. I think the most common cause of hypothyroid, things like Hashimoto's thyroiditis and Grave's hyperthyrotoxicosis and whatnot, um, are associated with leaky gut. And so avoiding leaky gut, you know, the best thing you could do is eat a low fat uh, plant-based diet because then you get lots of fiber and you avoid the toxic things. You avoid the oils. And again, you should be filtering your water. You know, you want to get the chlorine out of there, which is, you know, bad for your good gut bacteria. I recommend, you know, getting the F minus out of there as well or avoiding it if you can or having well water. That's just one more thing. The processed foods also got emulsifiers in it. Artificial sweeteners also promote leaky gut. High fructose corn syrup promotes leaky gut. There's a lot of things that do it. Um, so those are ways to decrease your risk of ending up hypothyroid. Um, F minus can substitute to some extent for the iodine. They're both halogens in the same vertical uh, column of the periodic table. There's bromine in the, in the bogus non-organic breads and whatnot. That's bad as well. Um, so those are just some things you can do to help protect your thyroid function. Perfect. All right. I have two other questions that I think I'm going to omit because uh, we basically answered them. But you did did just mention high fructose corn syrup. I wanted to mention that. Does uh, high fructose corn syrup make you fat and does it mess uh, with your liver? I'm going to let the doctor answer this first just because I'm a little occupied. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. High fructose corn syrup is a bad thing. You want to avoid it. And they can make it so it's like 65. They often do 65% fructose. It's not necessarily 50-50 like sucrose is uh, with the glucose and the fructose. So what happens too is if you eat a fruit, it comes packaged in its natural package. There's a lot of fiber. There's a lot of water. There's all the vitamins and whatnot. Excuse me. Versus when you guzzle some energy drink full of high fructose corn syrup, you got no fiber. So it very rapidly is absorbed from your intestinal tract, goes up to your liver, and it hits your liver as a bolus. The glucose goes all over your body. It's the energy of life. Uh, your brain runs primarily on glucose, for example. But fructose is not like that. Most of the fructose goes right up to your liver. And when it goes into your liver, the unique thing about it is it tends to enter glycolysis, the initial anaerobic carbohydrate met metabolic pathway in the cytoplasm of a cell. It enters it at the halfway point. Glucose comes in at the bottom. So glucose, so glucose let's say here, I'll use this. Thing. And here's the glucose, the good guy. It comes in at the bottom and it's tightly regulated. The liver is great at regulating glucose. That's the liver's main job to make sure the brain has enough glucose around the clock. That's yeah. the most important reason for having a liver. So 
it doesn't let glucose run through glycolysis, you know, the breakdown uh, pathway for energy, unless it needs it to. So the glucose is carefully well controlled. Whereas what happens, so here's the regulatory enzyme. This one's called PFK, phosphofructokinase, PFK. It's the most tightly regulated enzyme in glycolysis. What happens with fructose is it comes in at the halfway point above this reaction. Let's say the reaction is progressing upward and it enters at the three carbon phase, okay? Dihydroxyacetone phosphate, three phosphoglyceraldehyde, okay? So what happens is it's bypassed the regulatory stuff, just goes drip, and then it comes to the end of glycolysis, gets made into pyruvate, made into acetyl-CoA, and the liver's like, where the heck did all this come from? I don't got anything to do with this. I don't need all this. Make it into fat. That's what you tend to do with stuff yeah. when you don't have any use for it. So it just gets made into fat, and you end up with a fatty liver. I can tell you, fatty liver is so common. The majority of patients over 50 have fatty liver, okay? I, I Whenever I, I hear, let's say somebody tells me the patient has elevated LFTs, liver function tests. I don't even have to look at their ultrasound. I know they've got they've got a fatty liver. It's that common. Uh, it's almost always the cause whenever I hear elevated liver function tests. And I can also tell you there's a whole bunch of things that go with that. The same high fat diet, high animal food diet, it causes kidney stones. So whenever I see a kidney stone patient, they almost always have a fatty liver. They all go together. All these Western diseases go together. Um, so yeah, high fructose corn syrup does that. And then there's more about that. There's a couple guys that talk about it a lot. One of them is Richard Johnson. He comes from a background of being a nephrologist, a kidney doctor who got interested in uric acid and its um, effect of increasing hypertension, for example. Then the other guy is this um, guy, um, what's his name? Lustig, okay? Lustig. And oh, he's the, kind the of- the oil guy. Yeah, he's kind of a, a, a promoter of meats and stuff, that low carb diet. But he talks a lot about the toxic effects of high fructose corn syrup, okay? And yeah, I do think they exaggerate a bit. Everybody's kind of got their bias, you know? And a lot of times the meat promoters are looking for a scapegoat. So Nob, of course, says it's because of the omega-6 oils. And Lustig says, oh, it's because of the fructose. And it's a bit of both. I actually think the omega-6 are much worse. Uh, but anyways, other things happen to that fructose. When it first comes in, it so rapidly gets converted into the, the three-carbon uh, sugars in the middle of glycolysis it has to be phosphorylated. And so you phosphorylate a sugar when it comes into a cell because you put a big charge on it and that traps it in the cell so it can't exit back out the plasma membrane. And once it does that, that ATP, which was used to drop it into ADP for giving the phosphate to the fructose, that actually with fructose metabolism gets made all the way into AMP, then into uric acid. The uric acid goes in the blood and the uric acid causes problems. The uric acid inhibits endothelial nitric oxide. Normally when insulin... Um, is elevated after a meal, it generates increased nitric oxide to vasodilate the muscle capillaries. That gives the insulin more access to all the cells inside of the skeletal muscle so that they can take up that glucose and store it as glycogen. When you can't vasodilate inside your skeletal muscles because of the uric acid being elevated, let's say after high fructose corn syrup being a big part of your meal, then you get insulin resistance. And that glucose remains high in the blood, hyperglycemia for a prolonged amount of time. Insulin is also associated with you know, weight gain, uh, having insulin resistance. So that's one of the problems with it as well. But there's other things that happen. Because you've got insulin resistance, the pancreas releases more insulin, you get hyperinsulinemia. The insulin is cleared from the blood by something called insulin degrading enzyme, IDE. And that has a higher affinity for insulin than for beta amyloid protein. So you're less able to clear beta amyloid protein because you can only make insulin degrading enzyme in fixed amounts. You're less able to clear beta amyloid protein, BAP I call it, from the blood. And that's thought to increase your risk of being demented um, when you can't clear your beta amyloid as well. In addition, the uric acid inhibiting endothelial nitric oxide causes increased peripheral vasoconstriction, if you will. Your, your system, your blood vessel system is constricted down. So blood pressure has to go up to pump through that. It causes hypertension. And hypertension is associated with increased risk of dementia, heart disease, and whatnot. So there are reasons to think that excessive high fructose corn syrup is a bad thing. Um, in addition, what Johnson believes and Lustig, that it's sort of a way to fatten up an animal before winter. Um, if a bear eats, you know, thousands and thousands of berries. Now, like I said, I think what I've seen is the fruit eaters I see, they tend to be skinny, they tend to be healthy, but I do think you have to be careful, kind of like we briefly talked about before, you can keep overeating them if there's an unlimited supply of them. Um, so, you know, most regular people, you know, they can't afford to eat that much fruit. And I think fruit in moderate, small to moderate amounts is fine. And also the person, if they're active, I mean, if you're you're walking around and you're active, you you can handle it. But if you're sedentary, uh, and you're old, you might not be able to handle it so well. Hmm. All right, Victoria, can you answer? 
Yes. Well, okay. I actually I get the role of playing devil's advocate here because yeah, I, 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 I knew this study. was going to happen. I knew this was coming. <laughs> well, the thing is, is I'm not like you know everybody should eat a ton of high fructose corn syrup here. I'm not of that crowd. I'm of the you know majority of your diet should be whole food, plant based, with the addition of refined sugar as needed. Right. But the reason I want to play devil's advocate is because I did find this study. Hold on. I'm going to go put the baby in his room for a second so I can concentrate. Okay. All right. Yeah. And I would say there's a lot of really healthy people that eat tons and tons of fruits. You know, there's that sort of famous ultra marathoner guy. His name's something like Michael Arnstein. He moved yeah, to yeah. Hawaii so he could eat almost entirely fruits. There's the mastering diabetes guy, you know, Bobby Bitteru, something like that, and Cyrus kumbata something like that yeah. and they eat tons of fruits and they're very happy with their diabetes control but these are all young athletic people when i say young i mean they're less than 40 and they're quite athletic and exercise a lot um and i do think fruits are good i eat lots of fruits but i also i exercise a pretty good amount and i'm pretty careful about my 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 athletic performance i track everything i do when i lift weights so i know how much I weigh. I know how many pushups I could do this month compared to another month. And if I felt myself slipping, I could catch it. But a lot of people, you know, they don't exercise at all. They're older. They don't have much meta metabolism. And I think they have to be, they have to be a little more careful, but it's also true. You look all over the internet, you see all these marathoners, triathletes eating tons of fruit. All right, Victoria, what is... Yeah, so, I mean, that's a th what I found with fruit. I've been eating a predominantly fruit-based diet for uh, since 2012, and my body's changed a lot. So, at first, I think I was pretty, like, carbohydrate intolerant, like, coming to that diet, um, and I wasn't able to process fructose the way that I do now, um, and my fitness level has also increased you know, during that time as well. I mean, I've always been active, but, um, I've always like, uh, you know, like Dr. Rogers was saying, tracked my fitness so that I, um, know, like if I'm training to like progress in, you know, running and cycling, which are my main activities. Um, but what, I, uh, so getting to the fructose, um, I'm screen sharing right now. Can you guys see this? Mm, did I shut it off? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, I probably have to turn it on. Hold on. Let me, uh, I, I'm um, a little new to zoom. So, okay. All right, here we go. Okay. So, um, wait, wait, it's not I, sharing yet. Yeah. I'm not sharing it yet. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So when it comes to, um, fructose and over time, what I've noticed being on a high fruit diet is that, my appetite now is so regulated that I'll eat dates, for example, which is what I ate earlier. And I ate like 10 dates and my appetite shut off and I was good. So, or I'll eat like four bananas and my appetite shuts off and I'm good. Whereas in the past, I did experience that feeling where I'd eat fruit and I would want more. But now because my body's had, you know, a sufficient amount of carbohydrate calories, for a extended period of time for years, uh, my appetite signaling is so well regulated that I'm able to stay healthy, fit, lean, uh, with no, you know, metabolic problems, no health problems, eating a high fruit diet, eating a high sugar diet, you know, on paper, um, that I think that that's where people get a little, um, what am I trying to say? They, you know, a lot of it ends up being like dogmatic. So, you know, what I was saying earlier about the twins um, and how they blame their weight gain on eating too much fruit. I think that there was also something else going on there. Or, and like I said earlier too, about like not just exclusively eating fruit, having starches as well, so that you can allow your body to have really primed appetite regulation through leptin, through insulin sensitivity. And that's what mastering diabetes, um, you know, emphasizes as well with their high fruit diet is they're maximizing their carbohydrate tolerance by having these foods regularly, by having, you know, sufficient fiber in the diet. And that's what ends up happening long term with people who maybe come to a high carb low fat diet and they have insulin resistance or their carbohydrate intolerance
different, whatever you want to call it. Or they came from like low carb eating, which will still have like a low leptin profile generally because leptin has usually needs sufficient glucose availability to be regulated because our central nervous system depends on glucose availability in order to function properly. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. Okay. So I just want to talk about leptin really quick too, since I've been talking about it so much, but, um, this is a NCBI study here. I'm going to just talk about the function of leptin very briefly. Uh, but it, its function in our body is to regulate the balance between food and energy expenditure. Um, and its role, physiologic role here is of a long term energy, uh, is a marker for long term energy stores for the central nervous system. And that just goes to the fact that our brain requires glucose to function. All of our cells require a, an ample amount of glucose in order to generate energy. Okay, so as adipose tissue decreases, um, leptin, uh, the amount of leptin produced uh, decreases. So um, basically our central nervous system will sense a energy deficit and then it triggers a cascade of responses to help the body deal with the stress of starvation, right? Increases cortisol, um, promotes hunger. Uh, we've got changes in our neuroendocrine and endonomic um, autonomic mechanisms, including decreased sympathetic nervous system tone, decreased thyroid and reproductive hormone levels, decreased energy expenditure. So you're going to be storing energy rather than utilizing energy, right? Um, uh, yeah, so it's a catalyst into our bodies, uh, into starvation mode, right? So when we don't have enough food coming in, we don't have enough carbohydrates coming in, leptin is going to make it so we don't die basically. Mm. Uh, and that's something that's really important for people to understand because so many people, and I think I'm going to get into talking about fructose very quickly here. They fear carbohydrates. So that fear of carbohydrates, that under eating of carbohydrates is going to fuel obesity as well. I mean, how many obese people consume like a high fat diet and then drink diet Coke, right? Because they think that they're cutting their sugars and they're going to lose weight doing that. Um, so this study here from the National Library of Medicine is uh, sucrose, high fructose, corn syrup, and fructose, their metabolism and potential health effects. What do we really know? This is from 2013. And it basically looks at um, fructose, glucose, high fructose, corn syrup, and sucrose, and how they relate to obesity and adverse health outcomes. And the findings of this study are very interesting. So I'm just going to go down to, uh, here's a uh, fructose metabolism, just like Dr. Rogers was talking about and how this is the pathway here, this uh, triose phosphate here. This is how it ends up uh, as a getting shipped into fat, right? Yeah. Uh, through this pathway here. But fructose will also get funneled into the ATP cycle as well, or the TCA cycle, I'm sorry, uh, through producing pyruvate. So I wonder if the information that's found about fructose causing fatty liver uh, and all these other health outcomes like the generation of uric acid, for example, is um, done on people who consume a high fat diet or a, a diet that's not controlled for fat while consuming fructose, because the findings of the study are really interesting. Uh, this says here, even in settings of extreme carbohydrate overload, only a small percentage of carbohydrate is converted into fats in the process of de novo lipogenesis. Um, so in their experiment, they fed people 1500 extra calories in excess of carbohydrates and only 3.3 grams of fat was generated here. And um, they did use healthy individuals. So we're not talking about starved people. So, I, I, and that's something that's important to register too, because the majority of people that I work with are coming to me from a calorie restrictive, you know, low carb yeah. background. So this really doesn't apply to them in terms of like how de novo lipogenesis will be ramped up in cases of people coming from starvation mode to a high carb diet. Um, so I just want to go down to the conclusions here. 
and you know this isn't this is open to interpretation but this is basically what they found um is that uh, fructose consumption at 25% of calories compared with glucose at 25% of calories acutely increased uric acid profiles. Uh, however, research in our lab comparing high fructose corn syrup with sucrose yielded identical responses and no increases in acute levels of uric acid in either normal weight or obese women were found. Um, and then it also says down here, whether fructose consumption results in increased factors, risk factors for metabolic syndrome also remains in dispute. And uh, what was the other one? Yeah, here. Studies exploring whether fatty infiltration of the liver or muscle occurs in response to fructose consumption have produced disparate findings. And I think the reason why this study is all over the place where they're finding certain people have higher uric acid profiles, certain people don't have any, you know, changes in uric acid or, or fatty liver is all comes down to like how that individual is metabolizing the fructose. Also what their metabolic rate is like, how, how uh, active they are, um, how much dietary fat they're consuming. So there's so many questions. And I, whenever I go through like studies like this, I'm always, I'm always asking myself, like, what was the fat intake like? <laughs> uh, because that will yeah. really vary what the results are going to be as well. Um, as well as like, what um, kind of diet was this person eating previously that's going to have an effect on it. Um, but in general, at least in my personal experience and the experience that I work with my clients who I can get them on a high carb, low fat diet, and I can keep them on it long term, they all end up experience improved blood work, including lipid profiles, um, triglyceride levels, um, liver enzymes. Um, and that's eating a high, you know, sugar, high fruit, high carbohydrate diet, uh, with the addition of, you know, or low, a high carb, low fat diet with the addition of refined sugars. Um, and I think the reason that happens, and it's something I've experienced with myself too, eating a high carb, low fat diet long-term with the addition of, you know, sugar, high fructose corn syrup on occasion, um, things like that is because I'm not experiencing this like spillover effect. You know, my appetite is regulated, so I'm not you know, converting the fructose into the fat and increasing my uh, liver, you know, and creating fatty liver. Um, but there's a lot that goes into, you know, why that's going to happen in, in people, why it happens in certain people and why it doesn't in others. Perfect. All right. Let me, uh, You know, I had the next question I have is do we actually need to exercise or is it a waste of time? Exercise has been mentioned. So let's just like almost yes or no this one. Like, do you okay, think that um, exer exercise is really needed? Yeah. I mean, the thing with exercise is that we're designed to move. We have skeletal muscle for a reason, it allows our body to move. I, exercise every day, just like cleaning my house, taking care of my baby, walking my dog, you know, that's all exercise. And the thing is, is the more uh, glucose and fructose um, or energy you have, like moving through your TCA cycle to generate ATP so that you can have energy to do work, you're naturally going to end up with a higher metabolic rate just from eating that high carb, low fat diet and your output being getting higher, right? So while you are shunting that uh, glucose into your muscle cells for energy production, you're, you're going to get better at it. Um, and exercise improves that as well. Exercise also lowers insulin needs. Um, exercise helps you to burn more body fat because you're able to take in more oxygen. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to exercise, but it doesn't have to be uh, where you're overtraining. But I think that you know, if you want to be healthy, it's recommended to do like 120, 150 minutes of aerobic exercise on a weekly basis. And I think that's all people really need to do in order to be, you know, baseline healthy. All right. I'm going to exit. Edit these. Okay. All right. All right. So a couple of things I would say about exercise, I would say, yeah, we definitely need to exercise. For example, I see a lot of patients who are immobilized for a certain amount of time. Let's say they get a fracture in their ankle and they don't move their ankle. It can very quickly become demineralized the bone and the muscles can become atrophic pretty fast. So 
to a large extent, our bodies use it or lose it. We can also remember things we did when we were younger. Like I used to wrestle every day and it was a natural thing to do. Now, yeah. because I haven't wrestled in a long time, I can wrestle a little bit with my nephew, but I can't wrestle too much. I got, I'm, I'm not as strong and I got little injury problems. What I'm trying to say is you got to keep doing stuff or you lose the ability to do it. Um, that's one thing too. The other reason is, you know, why do animals have brains? Okay. Animals have brains because they move. Uh, a plant just sits in one spot. It doesn't need, it doesn't need a brain, but as soon as you start to move, you have to make a value judgment. I'll go towards, you know, the food, the fruit tree. I'll avoid the danger over there to coyotes or something. You got to navigate obstacles. And what I'm trying to say is exercise and your brain go hand in hand together. When you exercise, you increase something called brain-derived neurotropic growth factor to facilitate synaptogenesis and neurogenesis, making new neurons and you know maintaining optimal function in your synapses, the connections between neurons. So it's very much related to cognitive health. And preventing dementia, people who exercise have much lower risk of dementia. You can also look, you ever heard of the sea squirt? The sea squirt, when it's a juvenile, it swims around like a tadpole. Um, in its adult phase, it attaches to a rock. Okay, so it needs a brain as a tadpole. It's moving around as an adult. When it attaches to a rock, its brain is entirely resorbed because it becomes a filter feeder. It doesn't you don't need a brain if you just sit around? Uh, so I think that exercising is a big part of maintaining high level cognitive function. Um, I also think you know exercising a lot it increases cognitive function all the way through life, even when you're young, all the way through life. Um, let's see, what are some other things about it? Because there's more to it than that. It improves your self esteem. It improves your physical experience. Uh, exercise and grip strength make you live longer. You not only get increased BDNF, you get increased mitochondrial biogenesis, the formation of new mitochondria in your brain. You get increased glycogen storage in your brain, like in your astrocytes, called glycogen supercompensation. You get some angiogenesis, the growth of new small capillaries around the parts of your brain that are more active and um, in association with the exercise. And that's a good thing, okay? Because, you know, I look at brains, and older people often have relatively hypovascular brains and compare with younger people. You know, I think that's the, the typical story of the average American. You know, the high fat diets, atherosclerosis, hypertension, diabetes, and a progressively gradually devascularized brain that just shrinks and becomes atrophic. And I think exercise is part of how you help prevent that. Exercise increases your insulin sensitivity. It kind of, you know, gets the glucose type yeah. four quarters to go from the skeletal muscle cytoplasm up to the plasma membrane to be able to take in glucose. It, it does very much the same thing. So that's a way to improve your insulin sensitivity. So I actually think people should try to just keep moving and keep busy every day. If you go out for a walk in the woods, you'll notice there's not a lot of places to sit down. You know, you can do that Asian style, almost squat sit. Okay, but it's not that easy to sit down. And I think we're designed to kind of just be busy all day. Look at those, you know, National Geographic, Dan Butner, Blue Zone populations. They're all pretty active, you know, most of the day. Like I knew some people from Okinawa and they told me stories about them. The Okinawans are largely farmers. They didn't have any cars. They walked a tremendous amount uh, to grow their food. You know, they had tight knit family communities, respected their elders. Um, and I think they were healthier than the mainland Chinese because they're eating less sodium. That's kind of a different subject. One last thing too about the fruits. I think the reason we got color vision is to see fruits when they're ripe. I think that's the best explanation of that. So I do think it's a big natural part of our diet. Perfect. All right. How often or how much protein do we actually need? Yeah. So the RDA for protein is 46 grams a day for women, 56 grams a day for men. And I think that those figures are accurate. We, a lot of people don't realize that we recycle 70 to hundred grams of endogenous protein every single day, which means that that's going to be serving as a large, uh, backup for when we need to replace proteins in our body. So another reason why we don't need to consume a lot of it. Um, uh, if I'm going to screen share again, I'm just going to show Walter Kempner's work. Um, let's see here. All right. So let's see Walter Kempner. Yeah. So this is, um, the rice diet components. You can see here that this is your ordinary mixed diet. This is what most people are eating. You know, hundred grams of fat a day, hundred grams of protein a day, 300 grams of carbohydrate, a lot of sodium. Um, and this fat amount and this protein amount is what causes chronic diseases. Um, and if you look at the reason why, Kempner's work, which he was reversing diabetes, he was improving uh, heart disease. Um, he was basically reversing all your standard chronic diseases, utilizing this macronutrient um, ratio 
uh, diet where it's only five grams of fat, 25 grams of protein and all this carbohydrate because we run we need carbohydrate to run our cellular energy mechanics right uh for atp production we don't use protein and fat for that these are anabolic nutrients these are nutrients for building and i think the best example of human protein needs is in mother's breast milk right which is very high in carbohydrate and low in fat and protein and that diet is intended to carry over as we grow and um through the eating of a high carb low fat plant based diet right plant foods naturally are high in carbohydrate low in fat, low in protein, your starches and your fruits and your vegetables are. Um, and when we eat too much fat and protein, um, particularly protein, we open ourselves up to um, diseases like cancer through IGF-1 um, increases. Uh, Dr. Um, what is it? The nutritionfacts.org guy, uh, Michael Greger. Yeah. He talks a lot about that in, um, in his work, uh, there's several videos he does on IGF one increases in protein and how it, um, uh, increases our rate of, uh, tumor production. So if we want to, you know, <laughs> improve our odds and not developing things like that, then we have to keep the protein low in our diet. So with the RDA of protein being set at 46 grams a day for women and 56 grams a day for men, I think that those are good averages. I think that you, you're you fine dropping below that and you're fine going a little bit above that. But, you know, getting into this 80 to 100 gram range of protein a day, it's going to be hard to do if you're eating enough carbohydrate. I think that the, the protein hype comes from uh, the you know, the hate against the carbohydrate, right? So yeah. how are people supposed to feel full if they are supposed to keep their carbohydrate content low? Then they're going to increase their protein content of their diet, right? Through the consumption of what? Animal protein. Uh, and so I think that the emphasis on protein in our uh, nutritional, you know, dogma world through media, um, has been to get people to eat animal products. And it gets back into what we were talking about earlier about how everybody wants you to eat, you know, high fat, high protein, low carb, yeah. um, because it actually like suppresses us. It suppresses us, you know, in every kind of a way, especially, uh, neurologically speaking, because we're not allowing our brain to have the glucose that it needs in order to function. Um, the other thing with protein is that I'm going to use myself as an example. Again, I just went through a pregnancy and I'm now currently exclusively breastfeeding a almost 20 pound five month old. Um, and I've built him exclusively from a high carb, low fat, low protein diet. The majority of my food that I eat is fruit and rice. I follow, you know, the Walter Kempner's rice diet. And I'd say my protein intake averages between 40 and 50 grams of protein a day. They say that you should eat more protein when you're pregnant, more protein when you're nursing. I don't find that to be the case. I just eat, you know, a high carb, low fat diet and my body does the rest. I don't need to be eating extra protein. The other thing with protein too, is that when you eat more protein and eat less carbs, what a lot of people don't realize is they're just going to be turning that excess protein that they are consuming into glucose, or they're going to be turning it into fat. Uh, and they're also going to be increasing their uric acid levels as they are trying to yeah. uh get rid of this extra protein that they're taking in as well. That's actually a big reason why um, Walter Kempner put people on such a low protein diet is because he was trying to improve their kidney function. Um, and he was successful in doing so. And the other thing with protein <laughs> that I like to say is that when we under eat carbohydrate, um, we are, our after we use up all our glycogen, we go into something called gluconeogenesis. And that is where we start turning protein and fat into glucose in order to keep our 
blood sugar levels um, maintained to keep us alive, right? Uh, when we start getting into energy deficits. Uh, well, we utilize protein first. So if we're eating the extra protein and keeping our carbs low, we're just turning it into glucose anyways. And then it doesn't end up being... Protein isn't muscle protective like people think that it is. You know, everybody's like, eat your protein in order to have these big, strong muscles. It's actually the opposite. When you focus on all that protein, you actually make your body, when you go in, when you're in gluconeogenesis, let's say pretty regularly because you under eat on carbohydrates, you're always going to be taking from your dietary intake of protein or taking from your skeletal muscle protein um, because we don't have like storage protein like we do for carbohydrate in the form of glycogen. Um, so I always tell people if they're looking to, you know, build muscle and preserve that muscle, you have to eat a sufficient amount of carbohydrate in order to avoid turning that precious, you know, muscle tissue that you've been working so hard to gain in the gym into glucose for energy production. Perfect. All right. Let me close this out. All right. You're up. Okay. So yeah, I think we, we do tend to eat way too much protein and, um, you know, the Papua New Guinea, they eat like 93% of their calories from sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes only have about four and a half percent of their calories from protein. Those guys are real fit and strong. You really don't need much. And human breast milk is only about five to 6% of the calories from protein. And that's at the time of maximal growth in one's life. The rest of your life, you'd expect to need more. And you do need less than that. Okay. And Nathan Pritikin had studied this question of how much protein do people need? And he came to the conclusion in any naturally chosen diet, it's impossible to be too low in protein. Impossible, okay? Um, and, and my study of the subject too suggests the same thing. So you want to minimize your protein. Like she mentioned about um, Kempner, he wanted to minimize dietary protein because that's the main thing the, the kidney does is it excretes nitrogen. There's nowhere for the nitrogen to go. We don't store it anywhere in the body. So the kidney has to excrete it. So when you eat that excess nitrogen, nitrogen, you're putting a big workload on your kidneys, okay? And it'll often come in the context of meat. And then all the inflammation that comes with meat adds to the workload additionally of the kidney. So you want to protect the kidney, lower the nitrogen load. And then getting back to the idea of, you know, why do people accelerate their aging? Why do people have increased cancer? And the animal protein has a different amino acid composition. It's got, got more leucine, for example, branch chain amino acid that's thought to especially activate mTOR. mTOR is mammalian target arapamycin, also called mechanistic target arapamycin. It's a nutrient sensing pathway, like a contractor getting ready to build a building, waiting for its last set of uh, building materials before it says, let's go, let's build. Okay. And it, it often tends to be leucine. Methionine is also related to that, another amino acid more common in meat. So what I'm basically saying is meat sort of primes cells to replicate. When you got this surplus of these relatively scarce amino acids, the cell can then replicate. And the relevance of that being is there's something called the Hayflick limit. Hayflick was a molecular bio biologist working with human tissue culture cells, and he found they only divide about 60 times. Okay, and after that, they go into senescence, they age and they, they die. And so why is that? Because they have telomeres at the end that are like shoelaces. And each time you replicate, you shorten the length of the chromosome a little bit. And eventually you start shortening into genes that you need. So that cell is going to need those proteins and need those genes, and then it's going to die. So what I'm trying to say is, in my opinion, they're kind of all the same thing, uh, mTOR, as well as insulin-like growth factor. That's also elevated by protein in general, and especially animal protein. And then this whole concept of uh, having telomere shortening. So they all kind of go together. All right. So those are three pathways that push you down the path of accelerated aging. So you don't want that. So by decreasing your dietary protein, especially avoiding animal protein, you get less insulin like growth factor in your blood. You get less unnecessary activation of mTOR. Okay. And then the counter argument is they go, well, you're going to be weak. You're going to be a wimp. Uh, you know, all these old people, they have, you know, sarcopenia, loss of muscles. They need to eat more protein. I think that's a bogus argument, by the way. I'm also going to say something here. I'm 60 years old. Okay. I occasionally go to the gym and lift weights with young guys. I had an old shoulder injury, so I don't bench press. And they kind of tease me about chest strength, you know, um, but for what it's worth. So we had a push-up contest with a bunch of young guys. These are all young guys, either late teens to, yeah. to early thirties. I could do 78 push-ups in a set. They could all do a lot less than this. What I'm trying to say is 
I don't, I eat low protein. I probably eat about 9% of my calories from protein. You don't need these giant protein intakes. That's all BS, okay? I also think a lot of these young guys, they carry their cell phones in their front pocket. I think they microwave their balls all day. And I think that's why they're not as strong as they want to be. Um, and they also sit with their laptop computer on their laps, which also uh, has a low, low power microwave transmitter. It's a uh, microwaving their gonads. And I think that's part of why, because, you know, they say all these stupid things. Well, I got to eat more protein. I'm thinking about going on testosterone. I'm like, you know, stop putting your cell phone in your front pocket. Okay. Stop being stupid. You don't need to go on testosterone. You know, you're 20 years old. <laughs> you crazy. Um, but you know, I think that's, that's the case. I, they, they tell people, Oh, you're, you're deficient in protein. I think that study was done kind of in a bogus way. I think Walter Longo was one of the researchers on that. Um, I think that, you know, all these blue zone people, they don't go taking protein supplements and these Okinawans that are still doing pushups and exercising and dancing when they're over hundred years of age. Um, I think that's all an exaggerated thing. Uh, my sister did this yesterday. So my sister, uh, was in Florida and she came back, uh, home and I was actually watching her house. So I was, and she stopped at my parents' house and I stopped there too. And she's like, well, I didn't have enough protein over the weekend. So I got a headache. I said, I, I, I don't even get into <laughs> I don't even get into it with her because she is uh, vicious, but yeah, I, I'm just like, oh, okay. I'm sure that's what the, the cause was. Yeah. But that's what they do is they think that they need protein for energy or whatever. Yeah, like it's yeah. so programmed through the media to make people think that the most important macronutrient is protein and now healthy fats too, you know, but oh, yeah, that's what, coming, what about yeah. the carbohydrate? Like I, I feel bad for the carbohydrate. He's like yeah. my best friend and everybody hates on it. And that's really what people should be eating. You, If you're having a headache, it's probably from elevated cortisol and uh, not eating enough carbohydrate, you know, and a sweet potato would have fixed it. Yeah. Uh all right. So next question. Uh, uh, you did mention the set point and I, I wanted to talk about it. Is there such a thing as, as weight set point? Uh, I believe there is. Yes. Um, and for myself, I'll use it as, a, as an example here. Um, I think that the BMI, uh, scale is pretty accurate. You know, it gives you a wide range of weights that you can be at where you're healthy, basically. And for myself, I'm almost six foot tall. So about five eleven and a half. and a half and my weight, you know, eating as much, uh, as I want is about 150 pounds. Um, and for me genetically, that's, you know, what I weighed when I graduated high school. Um, that's just, you know, as a college athlete, like that's my bone structure. I played basketball, so I'm not like super petite, but I'm not like, I don't have a really big bone structure either. So falling right in the middle and me being, I think for me, that's like a BMI of 21. I believe. Um, but I've, I've been as low when I'm not, you know, I'm only five months postpartum right now and I'm currently breastfeeding when I'm not breastfeeding and I'm not pregnant. And, you know, I'm kind of away from like the baby stage. My, my BMI falls to like a 19. Um, but it, you know, to be like under a BMI of like 18.5, which would classify as being underweight, um, or to be over a BMI of, 24.9, which would classify someone as being overweight, according to the BMI scale, um, following this, a high carb, low fat diet, I've been on the far end where my BMI has been like 24.9. When I first adopted the diet coming from, you know, what I refer to as metabolic damage, where I came from a low carb calorie restrictive, you know, fasting, stimulant taking, you know, caffeine using diet, um, my body, you know, went all the way up and now it's come all the way back down. And then it just sits there where I'm, I call it being effortlessly, you know, fit, lean and healthy because I don't have to do much other than just eat uh, a high carb, low fat diet and exercise regularly. And my body just stays, you know, at the size that it is. Um, and more importantly, it stays healthy. So I think that that's important for people to focus on because at least not anymore, there's not this big push at least in, for females to be like underweight. Like there was back when I was a teenager where everybody wanted to look like Kate Moss and, yeah. you know, Giselle Bunchen and all these supermodels who, you know, sure, they could be healthy, like holding a BMI that's under 18.5, but I'm not sure, you know, you'd have to look at like sex hormone prof profiles, thyroid function and, and other things um, to see if, you know, that is some 
a weight that they can hold where they're healthy because I've been at a BMI that's been under 18.5 and I haven't been healthy. My progesterone was low. My estrogen was low. And those are things as a female that can happen when you don't have enough body fat. So I found, you know, eating this way that I don't have a problem with any of it. I didn't have a problem conceiving. I didn't have a problem like, you know, ever being pregnant with like, uh, being overweight while I'm pregnant or having any blood sugar issues. Um, so I think that when you eat a high carb, low fat plant-based vegan diet, um, made up of fruits, starches, and vegetables, um, and really emphasizing on that low fat, your body is going to find its natural set point. That's your ideal lean body weight. Um, I think that you can manipulate that, um, set point weight that is going to be, you know, variable for everybody by improving fitness. Um, so increasing VO2 max, you're going to naturally, you know, allow for your body to, lose more body fat than it would have, you know, not increasing your VO2 max, or let's say your goal is like, you want to put on muscle. So you're going to eat in a way that, um, is more anabolic. So there's ways of like manipulating what your set point is going to be. But I think that when you achieve metabolic health <clears throat> and not everybody is metabolically healthy. And I think that's why a lot of people come find me because they're like, Hey, I want what you have. You say you eat as much as you want and you stay slim, like show me how to do that. Right. And most of my clients are women, um, who have come from dieting backgrounds and they want to like, not have to worry about their weight. So, um, I show them, you know, what to do. And, uh, and it's very simple, you know, eating this way, you naturally, just achieve over time as your metabolism becomes healthy and you just stick to eating the way that humans are designed to eat. And like Dr. Rogers was saying, you don't see fat people in Okinawa. Uh, you used to not see them so much in China, but I'm sure if you go to rural areas of Asia, you'll still find yeah. elder people who are slim, fit, and healthy. They're not like super slim where they're, you know, suffering the effects of under eating, um, that can cause, you know, osteoporosis and things as you get older, um, or, and they're not, you know, carrying a whole, a whole bunch of weight either, but then you're going to be subject to your genetics as well. You know, what is your bone structure and things like that? Like, for example, my sister, uh, she was a division one or no division two, um, college basketball athlete. She was a center forward. So she's, almost she's six two, probably like lean body weight, 190 pounds. Mm. So you're going to deal with variations, but I think that the goal is to, you know, eat this way, stay on this diet. Your body's going to find its own natural, healthy set point where your body's going to function optimally. And all of your, like, when you go get blood work, right, everything's just going to be within normal range. And that should be the goal ultimately, right? Is your health is your wealth. And um, you want to also just focus too on performance over, you know, what your body looks like. Because ultimately, if you can't perform in your daily life, then what's the point of like a, a, with, with whatever aesthetic you're trying yeah, to achieve? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, a couple things. One thing I forgot to mention with the, the low protein diets, you know, everybody knows caloric restriction lowers, you know, makes animals live longer, improve longevity. Well, the fastest way to caloric restrict is just eat a plant based low fat diet, and you'll end up eating, eating less calories. What was interesting too, though, with regard to the low protein diets was a guy by the name of James Mitchell. And he gave a lecture, you can find it on the internet on YouTube, at what was called the Wilhelmy Buchinger Clinic. And the conclusion of yeah, his I research was, I did a video about that. So if you search my channel, you, you can you can find it. I actually reacted to that to that video. Yeah, he, well, his conclusion was you want to lower protein, even not just lower animal protein. He believes you should just want to lower your protein in general, uh, which is relevant. You know, if you're deciding how to plan a plant based diet, because you could be eating wet, tons of beans. Beans got a lot of protein in them. Typically, you know, in the ballpark, 25, 30 percent in that ballpark. So that you could be eating a lot of protein if you're eating you know tons and tons of beans i like to eat some beans every day because they got lots of fiber in them and they pro provide prolonged satisfaction of hunger uh so i thought that was interesting and he also mentioned that kempner's diet was an example kind of, of what he was thinking was a good diet for humans that idea of eating very low in protein um and we talked about the reasons to also eat low in fat 
Okay, so answering the question then, or the question was, what about set point? Yeah, I think people got a set point. And you can answer yourself that question just by walk around wherever you work or wherever you socialize. And everybody's about the same size today as they were last year and the year before that. And it's a pretty safe bet they'll be the same size a year from now. So they tend to stay on the same approximate diet and they tend to stay the same body weight. But you'll see from yourself too, when you've changed your diet, your set point resets itself. And I think it largely comes out of the arcuate nucleus and the hypothalamus as sort of the hunger center, if you will. It's labeled as such. But basically, you know, I weigh whatever I weigh. Like right now, I weigh about 175, eating a predominantly starch-based, but also fruit, eat a lot of fruit, uh, low percent, 100 percent vegan diet. All right. Versus when I was in my fat phase, I was working too much. I got in the habit of drinking lots of coffee. I wasn't sleeping as much as I should. And I was still eating some meat at that time. Um, and eating milk and I ate tons of cereal. That was a real convenient, fast way to eat. So what I'm saying is my set point, that's what it was. And you can, for a couple months, sort of fight against your willpower and your hunger drive, but long-term, you're going to pretty much level off at some point. And so the healthier you eat, the less fat you eat, you're probably going to level off at a lower, lower set point. Well, I did want to mention too, a lot of the um, studies on fasting too. I speculate that they're, you know, where they say a uh, animal that eats less lives longer. If that's just due to the fact that there's protein and fat restriction in the diet, as opposed to like carbohydrate restriction, just yeah. because for humans, if we carbohydrate restrict, we go into starvation mode. Um, and our body mechanics basically work to get us to start eating again. Right. So like we are animals that are supposed to eat carbohydrate every day. We, mm. we can store it, but we don't, you know, we run out of glycogen within like 18 hours, you know, and that's going to be variable depending on, uh, how, you know, fit somebody is the fitter one is I've seen that athletes can store as much as eight pounds of glycogen. Uh, wow. the average person stores about two to three pounds of glycogen. Um, but when we run out of glycogen, then our starvation biomechanics get triggered. So we have to eat regularly in order to avoid that because that process of triggering our starvation biomechanics, um, also causes, you know, distress in our body as well, which is why our hunger drive gets, you know, ramped up so that it keeps us out of that. I see a lot of people who will follow like a whole food plant-based diet and they'll say, oh, well, I went on this bender where I ate a bunch of fat or I ate a bunch of maple syrup or something and I gained 10 pounds. And I, my question for them is, well, how did you get yourself to the point where you were under eating that much, where you had felt the need to like do yeah. that. Right. Whereas I don't have that sensation whatsoever. I eat my food and I get satisfied and then I'm done. Right. So that would be the ideal way of eating that I would um, think that would keep somebody at like an ideal lean body weight without having, you know, that sense of like, I want to binge out on this pizza now, or I want to, you know, binge out on this. Like it's getting away from that yo-yo dieting because there is always a rebound effect with it. So, um, I think that we all agree, you know, to, uh, achieve that ideal lean body weight, you have to be leveled out with your food intake and your hunger and, and be really primed with your hunger and satiety cues. You know what? I want to ask this question because this question I get a lot. Um, and this really is, is probably, uh, you guys see this. Why do people claim carnivore diet cured them? You know, mastering diabetes just made a reel that's kind of went viral. I've seen it on, I saw my Instagram. I saw it on my Facebook feed, um, that talks about this actually. And they, and he, I think it was Cyrus. Is that his name? Um, he was saying that what happens when you go keto carnivore is that your blood sugar temporarily improves. And that's because you're not consuming any sugar anymore. You're not consuming carbohydrates. So people temporarily, they feel better and they're like, wow, uh, you know, sugar was the problem, right? Mm. but they never address the cause that they 
um, had insulin resistance due to the amount of fat that they were consuming with the sugar in their diet. So instead of decreasing the fat in their diet, they decreased the sugar. And then uh, he also talks about something that I've mentioned in this video as well is carbohydrate tolerance or car being carb adapted or how to become insulin sensitive because it can be a bit of a process for people to go from uh, especially a keto diet to a high carb diet um, because you're going to deal with feeling the effects of that insulin resistance initially until your cells start they until your cells become um, carb adapted so the reason why um, insulin resistance happens when we under eat on carbohydrates is due to the uh, decreased action on our GLUT4 transporter. Um, and so basically insulin, like it wants you to eat glucose regularly. It wants you to have regular carbohydrate. It's like, um, you know, you're uh, doing a form of exercise, right? And you stop doing it and you get mus muscle atrophy. And then when you start doing it again, it's really hard and it sucks. And mm. you go through that lactic acid buildup. Well, that's kind of like the way that insulin works is it's, it, it wants you from the time that you're in the womb developing to a baby getting on breast milk to being a toddler and growing up, you know, as adult to have regular carbohydrate coming in, right? And then insulin works great. It's like, I'm happy. There's regular sugar. I can do my job. But when you take the sugar out of the diet, then insulin doesn't need to work. It doesn't need to do anything, right? But the problem, though, is that all the fat that people eat, especially on the keto carnivore diet, once you come off of that diet, you're going to have so many problems from elevated triglycerides, the elevated blood sugars, to insulin resistance, to elevated LDL cholesterol, total cholesterol. I have seen it with my own eyes, unfortunately, with so many people where they go on these diets, the keto carnivore diet, and they come out of it because you can't do it forever or unless you have an immense level of willpower and you're also taking like fentramine or some kind of appetite suppressant where you're you know, pushing past your own biomechanics and own, you know, hormone signaling saying like, hey, stop, we need to eat carbohydrates, right? Uh, that's why we get sugar cravings. That's why, you know, people crave pizza and cakes and cookies and pasta because it's all carbohydrate. That's what we want. And then the fat is like the Trojan horse, right? Um, or the carbohydrate is the Trojan horse for the fat com mm. coming in through the diet. Um, anyways, uh, I've seen people become, you know, pre-diabetic type two diabetes, and they never re recover their health afterwards. And it's really sad to see. And then they could just continue on the cycle of, I need to control my food intake. I need to control my carb intake. And even if you look at the standard model for type two diabetes care, right? Um, the patient goes in, they get their blood sugar tested. They have type two diabetes. They go on insulin. They get um, a diet that is for keeping their carbohydrate content low and their protein high, right? That diet temporarily improves their blood sugar, but it keeps them on insulin for life, like low dose insulin. It doesn't fix the problem. And that's what I'm getting at. Um, and if you want to fix the problem, there's been several studies done. There's been several books written. Neil, Dr. Neil Barnard wrote, you know, the book on reversing, uh, clinically reversing type two diabetes, you know, completely, you know, you're not on insulin, your, your diabetes is gone. Um, and there's been several people with type one diabetes, they go on a high carb, low fat diet, um, and they improve, you know, they don't get off their insulin completely, but they don't need to use as much. So it's just a testimony for the power of this diet. <laughs> um, but also, you know, there is so much propaganda for eating, a carnivore keto diet oh, and those, oh, it's, it's endless and, the, it's and endless. dr rogers i know you were on bart k's and he's like totally gone down that path and it, and i read the comments when you did that interview with him and and the they're just crazy like i don't know how people like get like that you know it's like serious like programming and brainwashing and just going against like your natural design and natural desire for carbohydrate
Yeah, I um, I I did a reaction video to Joe Rogan. Uh, talking about sugar, I had to delete a hundred and fifty comments because they were so nasty. <laughs> yeah, and there's yeah. still like two hundred comments. I mean, that video just went crazy. But yeah, I was like, wow. I mean, and you really only see it from. I guess you do see it from vegans, especially like the real, um, like animal lovers. That they go, they go crazy. But yeah, I, I, it was it was nuts. Anyway. The other thing, too, that I, like I've been in the diet industry world, I graduated with my master's of science in nutrition um, in 2012. I was into the world of dieting and just interested in, you know, how to get look like a supermodel, basically, uh, before then, probably since I don't know, I graduated high school in 2005. So after that, I was interested, like, how do I stay lean for life? Basically, is like what I wanted. How do I stay, you know? Uh, a, a high level performance athlete. Um, we all, I'm pretty sure came to nutrition from some kind of angle like that, or, you know, um, uh, a lot of people come to it because of their health being bad too, but the low carb scene was strong back then. And then it's just gotten progressively worse. Like it yeah. went from just being eat low carb, you know, carbs are bad or watch your carbs, but you know, carbs still weren't as demonized as they are now. And then it went to the keto diet for a long time and Atkins and all that. And now it's this carnivore thing. It's like, how did it mutate into like such like a yeah. deranged like diet? I have no idea how that happened. Money. Yeah, I think, I think there's money involved in the sense that Imagine if the pros went low fat vegan, everything would change because you know, like I said, low fat vegans, they really don't need the healthcare system very much. They tend to be quite healthy versus the average American person really ages poorly. You know, typically after 50, they're already fat and sick. And I can tell you my friends in internal medicine and my own clinical experience, I still do a lot of procedures is, you know, most people over 60, they're, they're mentally slow. They kind of behave a little bit like a cow. Hi, yes, thank you. You know, they're pleasant. They've got the basic social skills, but they sort of lost that zip, that vitality, that clear, direct, quick-mindedness. And what I'm saying is the more sort of mentally slow a person gets, the less likely they're ever going to turn anything around. Um, also, if people really understood the way that chronic, the qu the chronic Western diseases are managed, it's rather extraordinary. The cure rate for pills, hypertension, coronary artery disease, and diabetes is zero, zero percent. Why would you choose a method of treatment that has zero chance of, of cure? I, I joke it's like Dante's, you know, the sign over entering hell, abandon hope all ye who enter, versus the vegan diet. It routinely cures hypertension, low-fat vegan, hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, um, you know, why wouldn't you want that? Um, and it's I, the same diet. And I think it's because it's a species specific diet. You know, the zookeeper knows that he's supposed to feed such and such to the gorilla, but our medical doctors don't know they should be feeding low fat vegan to uh, people. No, they well, don't. That's because they don't get any education. Like I was surprised that like the education that I received, they recommend that doctors take my course of study. And then I went after I got done with my education, I was like, oh, where's my job at? as a clinical nutritionist? And it was like nowhere. No, you know, maybe like Georgia had like I'm I live in Pennsylvania, but I was like, why aren't there jobs? You know, I, I didn't do the registered dietitian route. And I'm glad that I didn't because that's full of a lot of dogma, unfortunately, as well. There are some really good plant based dietitians, but I think eventually they went and kind of like did their own research to come to the conclusions that they have when it comes to nutrition. And it's just scary, you know, um, when the what you eat influences so much of what your health is like. Um, Dr. Rogers, I wanted your opinion about Ozempic, if we could talk <laughs> about that, like really briefly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so many people I know are taking it. I'm like, why don't you guys just eat like low fat plant based? You know, why do you want to starve yourself? Yeah, yeah. Like the Gila monster venom is stupid. You know, they're going to do it for a little while. And that's one thing, too, about like, why do keto, paleo, carnivores claim they get health benefits? There's something called the Hawthorne effect, whereby anytime you feel you're being observed and you're doing something new, you try extra hard on all the details, if you will. And you'll tend to do better initially. Like you'll lose weight initially because losing the water weight. You know, as you burn through your glycogen in your liver, there's about 
three, let's say, there's like three grams of water for every gram of glycogen, so to speak, the glucose. So when you burn through all your glycogen, you lose all that water weight. So you lose a couple pounds early, they get happy from that. But then they start running into all kinds of problems. You know, they're going to be constipated from the lack of dietary fiber, all the animal protein, you're going to be elevating their mTOR, elevating their insulin-like growth factor, which is going to accelerate aging. It's going to increase their risk of cancer. Um, the brain runs on glucose. It wants glucose. I mean, the body makes glucose if you can't give it enough. They would fail their glucose tolerance test. So like I said, they might temporarily get a decent looking blood sugar, but they fail their glucose tolerance test because their insulin resistance is high. And the increase in cancer is primarily due to the insulin resistance. It's not just the, the so-called blood glucose level. So you're, they're really damaging their health uh, long-term and it's not sustainable either. It's something you can do this for a while, but long-term, you know, imagine you're walking down a path in a forest, okay? And you see a dead deer and there's flies buzzing on it. And you don't want to get down on your knees and take a bite out of it. It's sort of disgusting, okay? On the other hand, you put a bowl of fruit on the table. We want that. We salivate. We're that. We're, we're made for that. All right. I think that's where we're going to end it. I do have other questions. Maybe we should table for another one because, I, I, I mean, we've been going at this for about two hours now. I did not expect this uh, to go on for two hours. But... I would like everybody to kind of tell uh, the the viewers where where they can find you, and I'll put that down in the description section uh, as well. Okay, um, all my handles are Nutrition by Victoria, and I do have a website www.nutritionbyvictoria.com, and uh, I've got free information on my blog. I've got lots of free information on my YouTube channel. I primarily use Instagram and YouTube. I also have a Facebook page as well. All right, perfect. And Dr. Rogers. Yeah, um, main thing I use is uh, YouTube. I got a lot of videos on YouTube. I also have some videos at BitChute. I got some videos at TikTok. I got some videos at LinkedIn. Um, I check YouTube the most often. Like if you leave a comment at YouTube, I'll check it. You know? I try to answer most of them. Not all of them, but I try to answer most of them. All right, perfect. So uh, based on the comments and the questions, I guess maybe we can do another one of these because I do have some questions that are probably pertinent. And we can go from there. It, it was a little bit to get this tied together, but I'm glad that it happened. And uh, thanks for thanks for joining. Oh yeah, my pleasure. I think the whole thing yeah, was great. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, no problem. All right, so I'm gonna end it here. But like like I said, based on the comments, I, I guess we can try to do another one of these. Anyways, like, subscribe, and I'll talk to you in the next one.